I'm here in Prada, standing outside a former church building. In its heyday, in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries, this building was nicknamed the Ranters, so-called because of the enthusiasm and life and spirit of the congregation and the extravagant, exuberant worship that they were known for. But now in 2020, it's an empty church building. The church has closed. The congregation does not exist anymore. The church has died. Once it served a thriving mining community, terraces of houses going down the hillside, the pits at the bottom of the hill. But then the pits closed in the 60s. The estate was uh, completely redeveloped. The old terraces knocked down new houses, more modern houses with indoor toilets and gardens were built. And the church became isolated, marooned physically in an area of green space, separate from the houses of the community. A symbol, maybe, of a church that was losing touch with the community which it was built and which it came into being to serve. The church's name is also deeply symbolic. It's called Ebenezer Chapel. And although Ebenezer is a rich and a deep name with meaning rooted in the scriptures, I guess for most people who walk past this building and see the name Ebenezer, what are they going to think of? They're going to think of Charles Dickens and a Christmas Carol and the character Ebenezer Scrooge. And for all he gets redeemed at the end of the story, for the most part, Ebenezer is hard-hearted, mean-spirited, self-centred, a man of no compassion, a man who actually avoids helping those in need. Is that the kind of image a church wants to project to its surrounding community? A church that's become irrelevant and out of touch. A church locked into the past and not able to change with a changing community. You might want to reflect on your own church. What does your building say to the surrounding community as they see it and walk past? And for most of them, never even think of walking inside. How does your church stay in touch with your culture as it changes? How does your church reimagine itself from generation to generation? Because let's face it, as George Carey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, once said, every Christian church is one generation away from extinction. The Christian faith is one generation away from extinction. So out of the challenge of churches in decline, churches ageing, churches struggling to engage meaningfully in mission, churches struggling to uh, engage with new and younger generations, the Reimagine programme has been born, pioneered by Baptists in the west of England and now taken up in the NBA and one or two other places. Reimagine is basically a two-year journey that helps churches uh, to work in teams, uh, to learn together as leadership teams from across different churches about how we can reimagine the lives of our churches so that we can be more mission focused, so that we can make disciples well, so that we can generate uh, relevant and, and enabling leadership, so that we can see the culture shift in our churches and in our communities, so that it is more infused, infused with the life of Christ. We're going to show you a short video now that just uh, explains a little bit more about Reimagine, produced by the West of England Baptist a few years ago. And then we're going to meet some of the people who've been involved in Reimagine over the past two years. And hear their stories, hear their reflections on scripture, and just maybe begin to reimagine what church can be like in 2020 and beyond. <laughs>
for today sharing with me are three of uh, the folk from Headland Baptist Church, uh, Fiona, the, uh, the pastor, uh, the minister in training there, Gwyneth, who's a deacon, and Jackie, who's part of the, uh, the music group. And uh, Headland Baptist Church have been engaging in reimagining, and like all of us, uh, has been affected by the lockdown over the last four months. So I'm just going to ask them, and maybe a quick sentence from each of them, what do you see uh, God being doing amongst you in these uh, four months of lockdown? I'll perhaps start with the, the pastor. Um, I think really, well, on a personal one for me, I would say it's probably made me be still um, a whole lot more than what I would usually. And, and, um, and it's by the church, I think it's done that as well. It's because we've had to, we've had to be still, we've had to, um, not be able to do as much as what we would have usually um, and I think that's been a real uh, blessing for quite a lot of people at the same time because of being able to actually just be still be there before God and um, those things of reading Bible more and has really become a, a lot more easier and probably so growing people really spiritually throughout this time there's been a, a, a reliance on God probably stronger um, than before, really. Thanks, Fiona. How, how do <clears throat> excuse me? How do the others uh, feel? And what do you sense, mm. either of you? I guess I could kind of echo what Fiona. I mean, Fiona's a musician, and she hasn't orchestrated this. But the words that came to me yesterday were about being still, mm. and I think personally, uh, that's what it's been for me: being still and uh, listening to God more than I would normally do. Uh, and of course, being, he introduced me as being part of the worship group, and I've been a bit redundant. Uh, oh, but I yeah. have been busy outside the church, <laughs> uh, and I think that's been a thing for me about being able to show something actually the um, uh, built outside our building uh, in a physical way by putting up the cross at Easter, by putting mm. up the prayer um, uh, prayer wall, uh, which we'll maybe talk about a little bit more later. But making our church a bit more visible from outside. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. And Gwyneth? Yeah, I think both of those things are what I would say as well. Uh, for me personally, it's really helped me to, um, to focus and to put priority, get my priorities uh, more in a better balance, you know, not flying off every morning to the allotment at the slip, you know. The, the first thing I could do, but doing other things, making sure I've had time with God first before I've done anything else, and um, just building that relationship with Him, I think better. Even at my age, you know, you think you get to this age and you think, well, you know, you're quite um, you're there really, but you're not. I'm, I'm just a baby, really. Um, and the, certainly the, the being visible. I mean, that was something that God strongly said to us at our first Reimagine Hub at Shepherd's Dean uh, when we prayed together that we were to go out of the church. And we've had to go out of the church. We've had to, you know, do those things. And the prayer wall, I think, has been really good. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. picking up a number of things there. I'm picking up uh, uh, an emphasis upon prayer. I'm picking up uh, a, a reassessment of priorities. I'm, I'm picking up a sense of presence, being seen, being in, in visi being visible, uh, mm. but also just being rather than than mm. being frenetically mm. active. Mm. Do you feel you've been frenetically active, or do you feel that you've actually had some sense of peace and restfulness over these times? Mm. Um, I would I, I would say I've really been um, <coughs> I think quite we've been active. Um, because of things like we're doing things online um, doing the kind of morning and evening prayer um, each day which um, which has been helpful as well really because it's been sometimes I've gone to do it and I've kind of felt a bit like oh but actually by the end of it you just receive so much from it um, so it's been so been quite active that way and um and like i would say we've we've got the prayer wall outside the church which um fully enough kind of like 
it came from Paul in a way, from uh, something he suggested. And then Gwyneth did one at home and both me and Jackie separately thought it would have been something to do at the church. And it just kind of like came together really, which was, um, which was great really, you know, sort of like God telling both and it, and it happened. So it was, uh, it was really good, but independently of each other. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so it's been good. I think there's been a lot more teamwork. Mm -hmm. you know sort of just telling one another giving each other ideas or listening to one another and you know encouraging one another I think you know um, which I, and that that led on to the the last reimagine pub that we've just done on leadership and how to be a, a better team together um, and, and recognising that other people are in the team even though they don't have labels on yeah, so that's quite, yeah, that's quite important. The sense of the team is not just the select, it was a, as a, an ethos of team that's beyond yeah. that. So, just looking ahead, um, how do you say God is leading you, and in what ways might the church be reimagined to be to be different? Mm -hmm. What's the sense of feeling and recognizing that we're in a transitional period? Really, lockdown is easing, but we're not back in the place where. We're as free as we were uh, five months ago. I think for me, uh, uh, people who know me well will know that I love walking. And um, one of the things that I've found during this time, uh, because initially we weren't allowed to use our cars to go to the allotment, I've walked to the allotment and it takes me 50 minutes. And when I could still go, I still have decided to walk to the allotment. But that has been been my Camino. I call it my Camino because those who know about the walk know that, uh, you know, it's. I've, it's something that I've done over the last few years, really, walking in Spain and then France and was wanting to do a bit more this year. Haven't been able to, but I'm doing my Camino in the morning. It's my Camino when I spend time with God walking. And one of the things that has really uh, come to me was the idea of prayer being so important in our church. And when Fiona came up with the idea of opening our church for prayer, as soon as, being Fiona, as soon as we were allowed to open our church, church she wanted to open it for prayer and that was just one of those moments when God said to me I felt this is pivotal for our church that we're actually bathing our church in prayer through these weeks until we're in a position uh, probably in September when we'll open up the services and I think that's something that I would like to see <coughs> continue that our church is open for prayer, not just for those of us in the church, but open to our community outside. And I think even if um, people from outside in our community don't choose to come in, the fact that they see that we value prayer in the same way that we have with the prayer wall, I think. Some people haven't written prayers, but they've commented to me, I live on the headlands, they've commented to me what a good idea it is. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the same, the, we've called the prayer space in our church a sanctuary and we've got lovely posters outside advertising that to people and letting people outside know that we're a place or we believe in prayer and that prayer is important in our lives and that God answers our prayers. That's, that's helpful, Jackie, because it, it, just by using the word prayer and even saying you know, we pray or whatever, however it's expressed, it's reminding people whether they go to church or not, whatever level of faith they have, that actually God is one who hears prayer and invites us to pray. Jackie, uh, sorry, Gwyneth, you were about to say something, and then I'll I will give Fiona the last word. Jackie. Um, yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> Jackie's expressed it very well there, and I think that I was. I was a person, I'll be honest, when Fiona first said about opening up the prayer, my human bit of me kicked against it a little bit because for me, our church is the gathered church and I didn't really want to do something that um, I felt we could do at home. I wanted to wait until we could be together and be the gathered church together I felt the, the people going into church it would be weird to just go in and sit down and pray um, but God has shown me how wrong I was to just to, to, to initially jump in with that first thought and he's he's 
teaching me. I want these taught me because I'm still learning. He's teaching me a lot about learning from him, you know, because I'm humble and gentle in heart and not to just immediately think my own thought, but to wait on, on him and tell me, for him to tell me what, what he wants. And I think the prayer room, the, the sanctuary rather, is actually being significant for me personally in my own walk with God to go. It's, you know, every time I go, he gives me something different to share with me. Mm. Um, That's so. helpful because in one sense, personal discipleship is about waiting upon God and, and mission is about inviting others to wait on God. It's one way of thinking about it. Fiona, I'm giving you the last word. Well, <clears throat> I've kind of, um, I mean, I think the sanctuary, ha it has been um, like a blessing for everybody who's gone into it and, um, and still, to, who can still go into it. Um, but I, I also felt a little bit that, like over these last four months, um, God's kind of used it to build us up individually as in our prayer lives, in our reading, in our, the way of discipleship. And then, you know, ready for our next step. So for going out, for being recognised outside the church, for doing things out, outside, um, you know, being more kind of relevant in the community and um, just for us to then just be that living gospel, really, to go out and share, um, to help to, not necessarily about bringing people in, but just to share about God and who he is and, and uh, you know, that we're there for them. Okay. Fiona, Gwyneth and Jackie, thank you very much. God bless you in your seeking of him and uh, your sharing him with others in Headland and even beyond. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we come to the scriptures. Our Bible passage is one that is at the heart of our reimagined process. It's Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 12, to where Jesus sends the 72, or in some versions, the 70 disciples out on mission. I'm going to hear it read in two different versions of the Bible, from Ashley and Jane Liston from Upper Eden Baptist Church in Cumbria. And what we'd like to invite you to do is what we do in Reimagine, which is a slightly different way of coming to the Bible. We call it dwelling in the Word. And as you hear the scriptures read to you, rather than trying to get your head around the whole thing, and understand the whole meaning, simply seek for one thing to grab your attention. Maybe one word, one phrase, one verse, or at most a couple of things. Just ask God to speak one clear thing to you. What is it that stands out out of all the passage? What one thing would God draw to your attention? Maybe something that excites you, something that challenges you. Something that makes you think. Something maybe you haven't noticed before. Something that's curious. Whatever it is. One thing. And you might like to simply pause the video and watch over it again. Listen to the passage a second time. Um, and, and pause just to consider that word or phrase that grabs your attention. So now I'll hand over to Ashley and then to Jane. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you like lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, 
it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Later, the master selected 70 and sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he intended to go. He gave them this charge. What a huge harvest and how few the harvest hands. So on your knees, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands. On your way, but be careful. This is hazardous work. You're the lambs in a wolf pack. Travel light, comb and toothbrush and no extra luggage. Don't loiter and make small talk with everyone you meet along the way. When you enter a home, greet the family. Peace. If your greeting is received, then it's a good place to stay. But if it's not received, take it back and get out. Don't impose yourself. Stay at one home, taking your meals there, for a worker deserves three square meals. Don't move from house to house looking for the best cook in town. When you enter a town and are received, eat what they set before you. Heal anyone who is sick and tell them God's kingdom is right on your doorstep. When you enter a town and are not received, go out into the street and say, the only thing we got from you is the dirt on our feet and we're giving it back. Did you have any idea that God's kingdom was right on your doorstep? Sodom will have it better on judgment day than the town that rejects you. Hi everyone, my name is John Hutchkins. I'm the minister of Berwick Baptist Church and our church was on the course Reimagine. And today I've read the passage from Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 12. And the verse that really, well there's a few verses that stick out to me, it's the first part where Jesus appoints the 70 and then he's sending them out. And he tells them that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. And my thoughts from that passage is that God appoints his people to go and he sends us out and he's sending us to different places and we have to listen for his voice and to go where he calls us to go. Our cities might be the gym, it might be the mother and toddlers, it might be the school, it might be the place of work, but there is a place that God has appointed all of us to be sent to share the gospel. Good morning everybody. Paul's asked me to, um, or asked us a few of us to look at um, the sending of the 72 in Luke's Gospel and to just very quickly reflect on what comes out for us. We often did this um, during the reimagine process where we would read some scripture and see what uh, came out for us. So I've just read through it again and the thing that came out for me again, because he has done quite a lot through this, is the idea of a person of peace. Um, so uh, from verse 6, if somebody who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. And if not, it will return to you. And I think the thing that I've reflected on uh, over this process and, and in, in my own ministry is that often I complain about the fact that there aren't people out there who are open to the gospel. And yet, in lots of different walks of life there are there are people who are open to hearing what god is doing in my life and being in situations and praying for a discernment of who is there and who are the people of peace and picking up on those signs to stop and wait and try and discern who those people are uh, and to be able to gently speak into their lives and to start to open up relationships with these people and uh, to be able to seed the gospel but also looking for for their opportunities i just want to give you an example of that um we've been meeting in a school for the past 30 years 
And throughout that time, I think the relationship with the school's been really based on the finances of we've needed somewhere to, to meet, they've needed the money, and that's been the way it's been. Um, and we found it really difficult to make inroads into the life of the school. And about two years ago, a new caretaker came and we just have a great relationship with the new caretaker. She's fantastic and she's really open to what we're doing. She's really interested in what we're doing as a church. And that's really affected our mission as a church. And as we think about the mission field that we have of being meeting in that school, she is a person of peace. And we're praying hard for her that, uh, that God's blessing will fall on her and that she will know him more. And that through her, we can find inroads into blessing the school. So that's my reflection uh, from Luke 10. My reflection is just to draw us to three words in that passage. The first word is go. The second word is peace. And the third word is kingdom or to expand it, kingdom of God. Go. Jesus sends his disciples out. Go, I'm sending you out. It's a dangerous mission. It's like going out like lambs among wolves. Mission is never easy. But it's a reminder that being a follower of Jesus requires us to go. God's people are always on the move. They're always going. That's what he does. He does it again and again, sends his people out. We get it at the end of Matthew's Gospel, most well known in the Great Commission. But it comes again and again. Jesus is always going himself from heaven into this earth. And when he comes to this earth, he's going to new people, to new places. He's going ultimately to a cross and then a resurrection. But he's always on the move going. God is a missionary God who sends and his people, if they are ever to be truly the people of God, are a sent people, a people who are going. Mission is at the heart of who we are because God is a missionary God. And yes, worship and prayer and, and discipleship are all part of that. But it's worship and discipleship and prayer that's always on the move. Seeking out those that God is seeking out. Seeking for God to do his work in and through us. So you might want to think for yourself and for your church. What does it look like if your church is organised around that principle of going, the principle of mission, if mission is at the heart of church life? And maybe through the lockdown you've had the opportunity to start to reimagine how church can be. What might it be for church to be organised around that word go? And secondly, the word peace. Jesus sends his followers out with this word to bring to those that they meet. Peace be with you. The peace of God. Peace to this house. The Hebrew word is, of course, shalom. And it means much more than um, good relationships. It's about the wholeness of God's life. The nearest equivalent probably is in, when Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that he's come to give life in all of its fullness. The shalom of God is well-being in body, mind and in spirit. It's living well with God and with others and with ourselves. It's fullness of life, fulfilment of life. It's all of the fullness of God's life within us. That's what Jesus' followers are given to then pass on to others. And let us seek people who are willing to receive that peace. Not to worry about the ones who won't, but to focus on the ones who will. Who are those people of peace in your life? Who are those people who are responsive? They're out there in every generation. You will know people who are open and responsive to the peace of God, even if they don't fully realise it themselves yet. Ask God to show you who they are. And as church needs to be reimagined, what might church look like if the peace of God is at the centre and the heart of all that we are and all that we live for and do? What might it look like for the church of God to be a church of peace?
peace, of shalom, not just for those in the church, but for those outside of the church. Give time to consider this. Our third word is kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jesus invites his followers to bring this message, the kingdom of God has come near. Or oh, I love the message version that says it's right on your doorstep. So close, you can almost touch it. What is the kingdom? Well, it's the presence of God. It's the rule and the reign of God. It's where, where God's ways are followed, where God is worshipped, where things are the way God wants them to be. We pray it every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. It means also your will be done in our lives, in our world. Whenever God's will is done, the kingdom is coming and it's there. So God's people are to be about God's kingdom. There's been a massive shift in, in mission thinking over the last 50 years, away from it being centred on church and growing church and getting bums on seats in our church services to being much more about what Jesus talked about. He didn't talk about church. Church is only mentioned three times in all of the gospel, but kingdom is mentioned more than a hundred times. He talks about the kingdom of God and his people are to be about the kingdom of God. So we're to look for the kingdom of God, the life of God in us and in others and to pray for it and to work for it and to see it come. Whether that involves church buildings or not, whether that involves our particular church community or not. We are to be people of the kingdom. And so, question for you to consider, as we might reimagine church, what might it look like for church to be organised around the kingdom of God? That kingdom is at the centre of things, not church. Give a bit of time to ponder this today. And that is something that as a church we've been learning, we've been on the journey, reimagine, and it's really helped our church to make transition. We were already a church that was very traditional, moving through renewal, and it came for us just at the right time. And uh, two of the main things that I would encourage people if they go on the journey of reimagine is to get the key people from your leadership and your church to go on that course. Rick Warren calls them the power brokers in the church. You need the people who are the, the shakers and movers in your church to be on that course, to go and to catch a vision um, and to have, take that vision back to the church. And that's what we did. We had people who were key people in our leadership and in the church who went on that course. And when we came back, another key thing for us, we communicated to our congregation um, in in a very um, accurate way what was happening for us we we spent a summer um, sorry <laughs> a Sunday um, sharing about it from the platform the leaders and people got up and shared where we were going what had happened what God had spoken to us then we had a meal and then we shared in small groups and on our boards we did a spider graph and we felt God was speaking to us to make our church a safe place for people and how that would come about. And for us, we started a little project such as an art group, which was the um, well-being art group for people with mental health issues, because we have some artists within our church. And out of that, we've seen a number of people helped. A number of people have come to church and uh, we've seen lots of little springboard events from that but also we've started going into different places of our community, like the gym. And uh, there we have a group of Christians who we're on the, uh, we have Christians who own the gym, but we go in and we're just involved in the gym and we get on with just being there, but we're sharing and we've seen a number of people come to faith. So over this past year, we've seen about 10 people come to faith. And I do believe it's because uh, reimagined for us was a, a catalyst of something moving into renewal and learning how to make disciples, how to do mission and all the other uh, things that you learn on reimagine, how to put them things into the church. But it's really important for key people to be on that course from your church and also to communicate with the church and take the church on the reimagine journey with you. And uh, I hope everything uh, works out for everybody involved in reimagine. God bless. 
We hope you've been inspired by what you've seen and heard. We'd love your church to join the reimagined process. We have a new cycle that's due to start in January 2021. The dates will be coming on the screen in a moment. Uh, we'd love to invite the leadership team of your church to sign up to be part of this learning community to go on the journey of transformation and change, of understanding what God has for you coming through this pandemic and uh, taking on board the challenges and the changes and the opportunities of mission in this changed world in which we now live. Reimagine will help give you a structure and support to go on that journey of change, become more missional, more mission focused, more engaged with your community, more able to see transformation within your community and within the culture of your church. So join us, please, and uh, get in touch if you want more information. Thanks very much.